Hello. Our story begins inside the Jedi Temple during Operation Nightfall. The Jedi Order was under assault. The clones were following their directive to execute Order 66. Anakin had killed younglings, knights, padawans, temple guards, instructors, Syndralic, and Shakti by this point. His clones were rampaging through the Jedi across the temple, just as their brothers were doing the same galaxy-wide. The beginning of the end of an era was finished. The Clone Wars took a lot, but now it would see the end of the Confederacy and the destruction of the Jedi Order. Skywalker was being trailed by a unit of his best men within the temple. He was keeping his eyes peeled for any other Jedi that might want to try and attack him, but truthfully, his work was pretty much done here. As he was moving through, he could sense the presence of his master, so he dispersed his men and moved to kneel before him. Sidious was pleased, as he always was, telling Skywalker that he had done well, and asking that he rise as Lord Vader. Anakin did. Palpatine put his hand on Anakin's shoulder and guided him forward. They moved out into the middle of the temple, where the floors were littered with dead Jedi. Palpatine motioned his hands outwards, telling Skywalker that this destruction would ensure that they could save Padme. They would use the dark side to fuel their quest for greater knowledge. He looked at Anakin and reminded him of what he must do. Anakin remembered, go to Mustafar, wipe out the Separatist warmongers. This was everything that Skywalker needed. He felt shame in killing the younglings, before snapping back into the moment and doing so without hesitation. Palpatine reassured his eager young friend that with the power of the dark side, they would be unstoppable in their desires. All Anakin needed to do was trust him, as he had for all the years leading up to this moment. Skywalker nodded his head. He was groomed for this, told day in and day out by Palpatine that he was the wisest Jedi he'd ever met, told that Palpatine believed he'd become the greatest of the Jedi, convinced that the Jedi feared who he could become. Anakin allowed this dark lord to twist his mind, because he never had any reason to not trust him. Palpatine's manipulation went through their entire relationship, and all Anakin needed was to be reminded that Palpatine had never led him astray. Whether she was a Sith or a politician, he never wanted to hurt Anakin. He always put him before himself. There wasn't a reason to doubt Palpatine. Anakin watched his friend move away from him on the catwalk. A royal guard unit rendezvoused with him, and Anakin turned back, preparing to move to the Mustafar system. First, he needed to make sure Padme was alright. That was his concern in all this chaos. As he moved back, he could hear Palpatine laugh. His eyes turned back, and he watched a young Jedi get slain by a crimson blade. Palpatine still had to have a little bit of his fun. Anakin pulled back to the moment and ran forward. As he came into the hallway, he saw a number of dead younglings. He didn't kill them, the clones did, but he thought about what Padme might think. If she saw him responsible for this destruction or killing these students, she might think lesser of him. While it wasn't the first time he admitted to killing off children, maybe it wouldn't be best to admit it when they're about to be parents. Plus, in Anakin's mind, there was no reason for the public to see Anakin or Palpatine inside the temple. If he was going to serve Palpatine for the long run, which he didn't really think he would, he needed to clear his name and that of Palpatine's. The only thing Anakin thought would be an issue was a misconstrued message, one that might come from seeing these recordings. Surely Palpatine would back him in that circumstance, as one of the Jedi to stand up to the Jedi Masters of the High Council and do what was morally right to protect Palpatine. Hopefully that was a story they would hear, if they heard anything at all. Skywalker just didn't need rumors of him inside the temple hurting Padme's heart. She would eventually come to see it as he had, that the Jedi were the evil in the galaxy. Anakin moved back into the Jedi Archives and took a Jedi Master's code from their belt, accessing the archives and quickly deleting everything he could. While he was doing this, he set up a come home message, the one that would tell all surviving Jedi that the temple was a safe haven. Anakin's hand hovered over the send message for a short moment. His thoughts were wondering if this was right or wrong, but Sidious was right. It was the pathway to unknown abilities. If he trusted Palpatine, he could save Padme, and when that was finished, he could go back to being like himself. Skywalker heeded the final words spoken to him from his master. It was a sound idea. Going further into the darkness would help him preserve her life. He sent the message, moved to the hangar bay, and joined her at her apartment before departing for Mustafar. When the following day came around, the Jedi Temple was lifeless, aside from the few clones stationed to kill unlucky Padawans and Knights making their way back to their home. Obi-Wan and Yoda were two of those Jedi, though they weren't brought back by the all-clear sign. They were here to see if their home was safe. When they found out that it wasn't, they were disheartened, especially because it meant they would have to kill the men 
they served with since the beginning of the war. They moved on the temple, wearing their robes, and they blitzed the clones. Killing knights and padawans wasn't like fending off two of the best Jedi in the Order. Council members were not comparable to the Jedi that had been slaughtered hours before. Once the clones were cleaned up, Obi-Wan and Yoda moved into the temple, and all they found was destruction. The younglings weren't even spared. They were slaughtered. The Jedi Order was in shambles, but then there was another painful truth. These younglings were slain by a lightsaber. Yoda didn't have the heart to tell his friend that it was his student that did this. Yoda simply looked at the destruction and felt his heart sink lower into his body. He and Obi-Wan moved about the temple, searching for the survivors of the Purge, but not finding anyone. The building was pretty much entirely empty and devoid of life. There were some clones moving about, but that didn't really count for much. Obi-Wan and Yoda stopped in the archives, as Kenobi told Master Yoda that he needed to see for himself who was behind this. Obi-Wan had reset the calibration for the archives, so hopefully there wouldn't be any other Jedi lost to this path. As Kenobi delved into the hollow recordings, he found nothing. Everything from the previous night had been cleared out. There were a couple recordings of clones, but that was long after Anakin had left the temple. Obi-Wan turned back and asked the Grand Master who could be responsible for this. Yoda's frown wore that of a truth he didn't want to tell, but it had to be done. He told Master Kenobi that his boy had been turned to the dark side, corrupted by Darth Sidious. Obi-Wan's hand moved for his mouth. Shock was worn on his face. He had millions of thoughts run through his body upon this revelation. He then spoke up, breaking through a crack in his voice to tell Yoda that he was wrong. Anakin wasn't capable of such atrocities. Yoda frowned. This was why he didn't want to say anything, because he knew that Obi-Wan would refuse to learn the truth. Yoda told Obi-Wan that he had to believe him. There might not be security recordings, but it was the reality. Kenobi shot back, telling Yoda that it had to be a deception. Anakin wouldn't be able to live with himself if he killed all those children. Kenobi continued assuring Yoda that his student knew how highly those kids thought of him. Anakin was one of their idols. Every youngling in the Order wanted to be like him, because they all knew him. He was the Chosen One, successful wartime general, and one of the most compassionate people in the Order. Obi-Wan's voice moved from shock and sorrow to anger. He told Yoda that he understood why the Council didn't trust Anakin, but it was them who told Obi-Wan to have faith in Anakin. If they believed there was faith to be had in the boy, then why would Yoda ever suggest that he do something so disgusting, abhorrent, and… and… Obi-Wan stopped. He looked over to Yoda who shamefully sighed, telling Obi-Wan that he could feel it upon their entry. Skywalker came in here with worry. It was hidden behind his determination to do something. Yoda couldn't figure out what it was, but his burden was left behind. The burden he carried because of Darth Sidious. The promise of something so unattainable. Sure, to Obi-Wan, this was actually a feasible reality. He could imagine Anakin siding with Palpatine so that he could gain something, but he still refused to believe that Anakin was behind this. He had to be somewhere. If not here, then he had to be relocating younglings and survivors to a distant location. Yoda tried to reason with Kenobi, but by this point, there was nowhere to reason with him. Yoda had seen Jedi fall victim to the dark side. Dooku was his last student, after all so he was more than familiar with the disbelief. But Yoda needed Obi-Wan to be level-headed here. Master Kenobi needed to find Skywalker and stop him. If he couldn't do that, then their religion might be lost forever. From their current perspective, there were only two Jedi in the entire galaxy, and it was them. They couldn't afford to lose their order because Obi-Wan believed something that wasn't true. Kenobi truthfully was outraged. The more Yoda spoke, the more he felt like Anakin after he was assigned to spy on the Chancellor. Obi-Wan told Yoda one last time, in an effort to try and stop this line of thinking, that Anakin was upset. He was polarized by the Council's decision to assign him to his mission, as well as the fact that he didn't receive the rank of Master. They spoke about why it hadn't happened, and Obi-Wan told Anakin that he believed he would receive the promotion after the war was won, which he then informed Yoda that Anakin took these words and held them dearly. Hell, even before going to Utapau, Anakin wore nothing but a smile on his face. Padme said he'd been stressed, but Obi-Wan made sure that his former student was okay before he left for his fight with Grievous. Yoda told Obi-Wan to stop. All of this was getting them nowhere. The reality was the fate that had beset Anakin. His orders were to find him and stop him. If it came through conversation, then so be it. If it came from a fight, then Obi-Wan needed to win. The Grand Master was going to fight Sidious and defeat him. Afterwards, they could find out what really happened to young Skywalker. Obi-Wan was incredibly disenchanted with Yoda. 
This was such ridiculous behavior. He couldn't imagine Anakin doing something so evil. So he went straight to Padme to find out what happened to him. Upon his arrival, she said that Anakin wasn't here. She was initially worried because Anakin mentioned that the Jedi had betrayed the Republic and attempted to overthrow the Chancellor by assassinating him. She was good friends with Obi-Wan, but still, she was on edge. Maybe it was in fact true. Anakin seemed to believe it was, and why would he lie? Kenobi came in with haste. He told Padme that Anakin was in danger, and he had to know where he was. He explained everything said by Yoda, and said that he needed to find Anakin so he could learn the truth for himself. Obi-Wan expressed through his words that he was only trying to protect his former student. There was no malicious intent in his voice or his words. To Padme, this was reason enough to tell Kenobi where to go, even suggesting that she would escort him there herself. Obi-Wan had no issue with this. He and Padme were friends. Anakin didn't turn. Why would there be an issue? Kenobi was well aware of the relationship and the fact that Padme was pregnant, so he wasn't going to pretend like she didn't know where Anakin was to begin with. They quickly loaded up and left for Mustafar. Obi-Wan and Padme spoke extensively about what Anakin said on the way there. He never said he did anything at the temple. She did reiterate what Anakin said about hoping that Obi-Wan was loyal to the Chancellor, not the Senate. This was a little weird from Anakin, especially since he hated politics. Obi-Wan was willing to ignore the odd statement though. What they spoke about the most was the apparent assassination attempt on Palpatine. Obi-Wan expressed what he and the Council had agreed to, which was something Anakin wasn't aware of. Had he been on the Council before the Battle of Coruscant, he would have been aware of it. But the point being, the Council believed Palpatine was Sidious, the Dark Lord of the Sith. And they agreed that if information was revealed that Sidious was that Sith Lord, they were to act immediately. There were two deals actually, one in which they learned the truth, and one in which General Grievous was defeated and they acted. Obi-Wan expressed that the news could have traveled to Coruscant, but from his perspective, it seemed highly unlikely that Mace would have moved so quickly after Grievous' defeat. So this led Obi-Wan to his next point. He believed that Palpatine was indeed the Sith Lord, but Anakin might not know. If he did know, he told the right people. But the question was, why would he go to Mustafar? Well, Padme informed him that the Separatist leaders were there. Obi-Wan then came up with a theory. He thought that Anakin made a deal with Palpatine, one where he learned the truth about his identity in exchange for the location of the CIS Council. He told Mace that Palpatine was a Sith Lord, and then ran, and then… well, actually, never mind. He'd have to go back and stop Mace from assassinating him. Obi-Wan just had to believe and had to hope that Anakin wasn't who Yoda said he was, but this realization might have just made it impossible to defend Anakin's actions. When they arrived at the planet of Mustafar, Anakin ran from the main complex to greet what he thought was just going to be Padme. When he saw Padme and Obi-Wan walking down the ramp, he got angry. Skywalker was able to bask in the darkness here. He was left alone with his thoughts and the final words of Palpatine, all of this leaving him to seep further into the darkness. Obi-Wan asked Anakin if he was alright, to which Anakin looked at Padme with a look of betrayal. She caught it. There was a madness in his eyes, and she couldn't really figure out why it was there. She asked what was wrong and Anakin looked back to Obi-Wan, demanding to know why she brought him here. They were both confused as they tried to calm him down, but all Anakin saw was a challenger. He demanded that Obi-Wan clear up why he was here, to which Kenobi told him the truth. Then Anakin wanted to know where Obi-Wan's loyalties lie, which were with the Republic and democracy though this was not loyalty to the Chancellor himself. Anakin decided to press further, wondering why Obi-Wan came here with Padme. There was a madness in his voice, one pulling him further from the light. Anakin saw Obi-Wan as that challenger, as someone that Padme could potentially be cheating on him with. Wasn't it Obi-Wan who was in her apartment before he went to Utapau? Why was he there? That had to mean something, right? The worst part about power is that like the Sith and like the Jedi, when one gains it, they grow a fear of losing it. This had Anakin back right where he was, in this moment, afraid that his former teacher was here to take everything from him. To take his power, to take his wife and child, to take everything he worked so hard for. But Obi-Wan didn't understand the madness, and because he didn't, Anakin believed he was being mocked. That Obi-Wan was trying to toy with his head. Skywalker grabbed his lightsaber off his belt and told Obi-Wan that he wasn't welcome here anymore. Obi-Wan was confused by this, 
but he stayed extra alert. He asked Anakin if what Yoda said about him was true, and Anakin looked at Padme and then back to Obi-Wan. He got a little arrogant. He was all-powerful, so he gloated, telling Obi-Wan that he killed Syndralic and shock T. He killed whoever tried to challenge him because they couldn't beat him. They were traitors, and he treated them like traitors. Padme could hear it again, just like with the Tusken Raiders. Anakin turned back to her, sensing her doubt, but Obi-Wan called Anakin's name and told him that this wasn't the way to go. Anakin nastily looked over to his master and told Obi-Wan to not make him kill him. Kenobi took this threat very literally, as he looked at Padme with a look that suggested get inside the ship. She slowly moved back, but Anakin took notice. As he moved to lift his arm, Kenobi ignited his lightsaber, telling Anakin to stop this now. The darkness was not forgiving. It would only take for him until there was nothing left. Skywalker looked back to his former teacher and ignited his own lightsaber, darting across the platform and engaging with Kenobi. Their blades were quick and remarkable. They didn't leave the landing platform, as Obi-Wan kept his eyes out for Padme to make sure she got inside her starship. Kenobi was in disbelief. How could this have happened to Anakin? He tried breaking him down, trying to find the boy he raised within him. Obi-Wan defended himself masterfully, trying to ask about Padme and why Anakin would do this, or ask about Ahsoka and what he thought Palpatine and his clones would do with her. What about Shmi? Would she be proud of this outrageous attack? Anakin was losing concentration, but he did not stop his attack. Due to them fighting on the landing platform, there was a shock when a blaster rang out, and Anakin slumped over to the ground. He was still conscious, but very confused. As he looked back, the blaster sounded again. Obi-Wan looked up and thanked her with his eyes, before he turned Anakin over and removed his lightsaber from his hand. Padme stunned Skywalker. She didn't want him to hurt Obi-Wan or for Obi-Wan to hurt him. She moved down the ramp slowly as Obi-Wan tried to make sure she was alright. This type of thing couldn't be healthy for her. Being on Mustafar with all the smoke, ash, and soot couldn't be good for her health. She agreed as he told her to get back inside and he'd get Anakin in. Within the coming minutes, R2, Anakin, and Obi-Wan would be inside the ship. 3PO piloted the ship away from the planet and back to Naboo, as Obi-Wan restrained Anakin away from Padme and kept his lightsaber away from view. When Anakin eventually woke up, he saw Padme and Obi-Wan sitting on different sides of the same room. He was confused, but he pulled at his shoulders, trying to release himself from the grip of whatever was keeping him tied down. Obi-Wan and Padme wanted the full truth. They wanted to know what happened and why he did it. While there was still the madness within Anakin, he didn't want to break. He was trying to be evil and brooding, and he was trying to obsess over power, but it wasn't him. He was a good person. Both Padme and Obi-Wan believed he was. This was someone convinced by a dark eminence to be someone else, to save someone from what was called certain death. Obi-Wan and Padme, while Anakin was unconscious, spoke about the massacre of the Tuscans. It was something Kenobi was completely unaware of, and upon his revelation, he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Now everything became more real to Obi-Wan. Being that it wasn't the first time Skywalker murdered as many people as he could within a single instance, it forced Kenobi to accept who Anakin was. As Skywalker tried to figure a way out of the situation, he decided that it was time he tell the truth. He looked to both of them and explained what happened. From the nightmares to the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, Following that, there was a threat of Padme dying in childbirth, telling Mace the truth of who Sidious was, the betrayal of Mace Windu, the march on the temple, killing an unarmed shock T and slaughtering the younglings. Each word became more painful for Anakin, because while he was aware of his actions and understood that he was fully responsible for them, only now, in retrospect, did he realize that he was being played for a fool. He saw how he was manipulated, and now, he'd have to live with these actions. Sure, the Jedi weren't great, and Anakin had plenty of issues with them, but they weren't the bad guys. They were a sincere order, one that could inspire the people of the galaxy. Anakin worded out how he executed the younglings in the Tower of the Jedi Temple, and he broke down. Tears fled his eyes as he tried to apologize, not to Obi-Wan or Padme, but those poor, innocent souls. He knew they all loved him. They told him every time they saw him in the hallways. They referred to him as Master Skywalker because in their young and little minds, he was nothing short of amazing. Anakin remembered each bone-chilling second. He could feel their terror rise, the shock in their faces haunting his vision as he tore through them. Not a word or a scream could be heard as each were faced with a polarizing death at the hands of their hero. 
the child who came from nothing to become the Chosen One. Anakin's heart shattered into a million pieces as his head slumped over, wiping tears onto his shoulder. His chest felt like it was being caved in, and for the briefest moment, he felt like this pain, the one in his chest, could kill him. Anakin's eyes drifted up towards the people he loved most. He dreaded looking at them, especially after he told his encounter with the younglings. And when his eyes met the gaze of Obi-Wan, he saw nothing but horror and disappointment. He then moved his eyes over to Padme, and it looked as if she would die right here in this moment. He could feel her dread, and he could feel the rip tearing through each piece of fiber in her heart. Anakin tried to say something, but it was caught in his throat. There wasn't anything to be said. It was done. He killed those children without remorse. He didn't think about what he had done, and now the reality of his decision was facing him. This time in the form of Obi-Wan and Padme's love being twisted against them. How can you love someone who did something so evil? Was it remotely possible? Was there redemption to be had? As they sat with this, Obi-Wan received a call from Yoda. He lost the fight. Dale and Yoda were going to pull his master to lick their wounds before Yoda went into exile alone. Kenobi thanked Yoda for the update. While this call was taking place, Anakin tried to think of anything to say, same as Padme. But what could they say? What words could be actually shared? Hope you don't mess up again? The Tuskens were semi-excusable. They were a tribe of maniacs that fed off the weak, but these were Jedi, especially the younglings too. Padme knew that scolding Anakin would do nothing to make this go away and never did. She wanted to say something, but not even she had the words to articulate her feelings. It almost felt like a part of her died. When Obi-Wan walked in, the room was still, eerily silent. Then Anakin made a proposition. He told them that they would likely never trust him again, and he still had to warp his mind around that, but they could work together to kill Palpatine. It didn't sound like a great idea, but it was better than allowing him to remain a threat in the galaxy. Obi-Wan looked at Padme as she shrugged her shoulders with a lifeless expression. Obi-Wan then turned back to Anakin and told him that he would hear out his plan and then decide from there. They eventually arrived to Nebu where Padme would give birth to the twins, which Anakin would at the very least have the joy to be present for. After they were born, they left Padme, who was still in healthy condition, though her heart still very badly hurt her. Anakin and Obi-Wan instead returned to Coruscant as Grandmaster Yoda retreated into exile. The former master and apprentice duo didn't have much to say. Anakin typically would expect Obi-Wan to scold him or tell him how wrong he was, but there was nothing, simply silence. Truthfully speaking, Obi-Wan believed that he would die in this encounter. Even if Sidious was tired from his fight with Yoda, which he probably was, there was no way in which Kenobi saw himself coming out of this alive. They landed at the executive building as Skywalker pushed Obi-Wan out, who was wearing cufflinks behind his back. The two of them walked in the Palpatine's office, where the Sith Lord was waiting patiently. Anakin walked Obi-Wan in before his new master, and told him that he brought Kenobi back so that Palpatine could make a public example of him. Sidious grinned, telling Skywalker that he had done well. It was a brilliant idea. Obi-Wan would make for the perfect public execution. He asked Skywalker if he was ready to learn what it would take to save his wife from her certain death. Anakin nodded, to which Sidious told Anakin to follow him. As the young apprentice moved to follow Palpatine, a red lightsaber ignited. At the same time, Kenobi broke free from his unlocked cufflinks and swung his own lightsaber forward. Obi-Wan could see it. Palpatine was going to kill Anakin, for he had betrayed him. Kenobi's blade blocked Palpatine's, saving Anakin from an instant death, as he ignited his own weapon and pressed forward. Sidious tapped his feet backwards, blocking the few strikes that came his way, before leaping over the Jedi and attacking Kenobi. Despite him thinking lesser of the Jedi Master, Obi-Wan was able to block the incoming strikes. Sidious was patient with his moves. It was one final victory until he could enjoy being the Emperor of the Galaxy for good. The Jedi Order was dead as it was. For all he knew, aside from Yoda, it was Skywalker and Kenobi. This would be easy. Plus, for Palpatine, why worry about keeping Skywalker when Padme was delivering him a child instead? He threw his blade forward as Obi-Wan blocked it before being punched in the face. Skywalker marched forward, striking heavily and pushing Sidious back. Their blades were speedily clashing away at each other as Obi-Wan joined in. They all tried to take the life of the other, but it wasn't getting anywhere. The biggest aid to their fight against Sidious was the fact that they had spent 13 years working together, and over the course of the last three, they had fought with Dooku more than enough times. 
Though this wasn't Dooku, and they had to be ready for any unorthodox tricks. Sidious was trying to get a grip on Obi-Wan so he could lob him out the window, like he did to Windu. But the opportunity didn't present itself because Anakin kept getting in the way. Their brawl carried on throughout the office, cutting up furniture, carpets, and anything else in between. Palpatine was getting irritated, so he lobbed a broken chair across the room, smashing into Obi-Wan's leg as he fell to his knees. Anakin and Sidious clashed as Palpatine told a young, former apprentice that once they were dead, the child he and his wife had would be his. Sidious was attempting to throw Anakin off his game here, but he was more familiar with the dark side by this point. Anakin used the extra rage to push forward. Obi-Wan did the same, catching Sidious who blocked and then threw him back again. Just as the Sith Lord took the same blade and dragged it across the wall and thrust the blade through Anakin's sternum, Skywalker huffed. As he held his breath, he looked down and then back to Palpatine who smiled with glee. Anakin reached for him with his bare hand, trying to stop him, but Sidious pulled his blade across and cut his arm off. Anakin felt the pain as he dropped his lightsaber and grabbed a hold of Sidious with his metallic hand. Palpatine panicked, trying to bring his lightsaber across Anakin's neck. Skywalker gripped Palpatine's throat and with all of his strength squeezed. Palpatine's blade slashed Anakin once more across the chest, from his ribs to his shoulder as he fell over, and Palpatine dropped to the ground lifelessly. Obi-Wan was quick to move to Anakin's side, catching him as he fell backwards. He lowered his former pupil to the ground, telling him to stay with him. Anakin was in a galaxy worth of pain as he tried to catch his breath. It was impossible though. He couldn't keep it. Obi-Wan tried to get Anakin to focus on him but his vision was blurry and fading out. Kenobi told Anakin that he was sorry for all of it. He never wanted Anakin to feel this burdened, and Skywalker stopped his master, shakily grabbing Obi-Wan's hand and telling him that he was not his failure. This decision laid on his shoulders alone. Anakin wheezed a little as he told Obi-Wan that he was the greatest teacher any student could have asked for. Obi-Wan didn't want to lose another like this. Please, not one more to die in his arms. He told Anakin that he could save him, he could find a medic or something. Anakin shook his head, telling Obi-Wan that he and Padme already saved him. He wasn't himself, and he wished he never did what he did. A tear slipped from Anakin's eye as he looked to his master, his vision getting even more shaky and his eyes even more blurry. He told Obi-Wan that he forever loved him. His lessons meant the most to him when he didn't have Obi-Wan around him. Then Anakin asked a question, barely making it through the previous sentence. He asked Obi-Wan if he could watch over the twins for him. Obi-Wan nodded his head, trying to fight every emotion within him so that he could be strong for his student. Obi-Wan promised that they would know who their father was and what Anakin did as his last fight against evil. Anakin smiled as he slowly drifted back. His body became heavier with each passing second and Obi-Wan tried to grip him, hoping that holding him harder would make him come back, make him stay alive, but it didn't. Anakin had become one with the Force. While Obi-Wan couldn't see it or feel it, his former master had his hand on his shoulder. Kenobi held his student lifelessly, while his master stood behind him, always watching, always seeing the Jedi that his student became. Obi-Wan eventually had to leave. He gathered up Anakin and ran. There would be security recordings of Anakin and Obi-Wan entering the room, as well as recordings of them leaving it, but for Palpatine's office, the security recordings were still turned off, so Palpatine would be found without a lightsaber wound but a broken neck. Didn't change anything, it was clear the Jedi were behind this. When Obi-Wan returned to Nebu, he came with a casket that was currently holding Anakin. As he left the starship, Padme's sister came up to him. Her face was puffy, as if she had been crying. Sola asked Obi-Wan what had happened, and he with a very weak voice told her that Anakin killed Palpatine. The Sith were destroyed. She told him that was good, but she asked him to sit with her. This immediately worried Obi-Wan, what could have happened while he was gone. Sola and Obi-Wan sat down. She was well aware of how close Padme and Obi-Wan were. She was also well aware of the bond between Obi-Wan and Anakin, so she took no pleasure in delivering this news. Padme had died shortly after he left. Obi-Wan's heart shattered. He looked over and his breath slipped from his mouth as he felt a stabbing pain in his chest. He asked if it was his fault, and Sola told him it wasn't. She grabbed his hand and told him that it wasn't his fault. He didn't do anything wrong. Padme died of a broken heart. She was consumed by loss. Obi-Wan bit his lip and nodded his head as he tried to fight his emotions, but he couldn't. His best friends were gone. 
their children left without parents. His order was in shambles. The Grand Master had gone away to exile, and here he was, with a promise to take care of two children without parents. Obi-Wan eventually allowed his emotions to release, and it hurt more than anything else in his life. It had been a horrid 48 hours, and he wished it was all a bad dream. But it wasn't. He, Bill, and Mon would be present for Padme and Anakin's funeral. It would be revealed during this funeral that they were married. Obi-Wan walked with the family, disguised, of course, as someone that wasn't the Jedi Master. When the grueling process was over, Obi-Wan was left with Luke, Leia, and Promise. Kenobi would hold that promise, and he would do as he said he would. He raised the twins on his own, going under the secret identity of Ben Kenobi. It was very hard for him, but the Nabarius considered him one of their own, because he had been such a great friend of Padme throughout her entire life. Ben took up a normal life on Naboo, and raised the twins with the help of the family. He would eventually find himself a partner, and his life would turn around pretty positively. The Empire itself recovered from Palpatine's death. Masameda kept the Senate in check as they moved to a more democratic system, one where they could control who became an aristocrat or not, before the system eventually abandoned those ideals. Order 66 still remained prevalent, but there would never be a crackdown on Force-sensitive people or speaking about the Jedi of old. The hundred or so survivors of Order 66 would disappear, some of them becoming darker iterations of their former self, like Balin Skull, some joining the Inquisitors and eventually dying off, others remaining like Obi-Wan and Yoda, staying hidden until the time was right. Over the next 40 or so years, Ahsoka would reunite with Obi-Wan and of course fight and kill Darth Maul in one final rematch. Ben would raise the twins as normal kids, but also teach them the Force and tell them stories about their parents. They of course called Ben their father and eventually had themselves a little sister, one that was actually Obi-Wan's biological child. But he never treated his daughter any differently from the way he treated the twins. In Obi-Wan's mind, he saw Anakin's fall as such, that while his actions can't be forgiven, it would be his return from darkness that saved the galaxy from Palpatine. That perhaps was a greater feat than anything. He saved the people from an emperor that would have done such carnage and evil to the galaxy. The Jedi wouldn't ever return. Obi-Wan had no intention to rebuild. While he would learn to communicate with Qui-Gon, he decided that it was time to let go. He knew that if the Order was to return, they would. If not, it wasn't his burden. He had 38 years worth of suffering as a Jedi. It was time he got a good life. It did provide retrospect on how he should have left the Order, and what other what-ifs could have been done during his life as a Jedi. But this perhaps was the best one. Sure, filled with pain, but his resolution was greater than even what he could have predicted, and he got to live a life with the Force brought to balance because of Anakin. Generations after Obi-Wan, Luke, and Leia had passed, there would be a young adventurer, one that went out into the galaxy to discover the secrets of the Force. This individual would eventually find themselves inside the Jedi Temple of Coruscant, which had been left barren for centuries by this point. They would follow lessons from the past, learn of Order 66 and Yoda and the Sith, the adventurer would find themselves on Ahch 2 after years of investigation, and in a galaxy that hadn't seen a real war since the Clone War, it would have itself a new Jedi Order. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to our patrons, Benjamin Wells, Ozpin, Angel Dust, Alexander Reese, The Beginning and End, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, INTJ Recluse, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tibbs, CC2024, Galavi Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Granity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee was 670 Anna Kashtank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tam, John Ndeguin, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Galaxy 66, Mamino Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forest Legacy Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, Command 3 First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. For supporting the channel, smash that like button, support me otherwise, check out the Patreon, cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. Well, that was kind of sad. The emphasis on the darker sides of the story are really what I wanted to focus on and how Obi-Wan deals with them. This is more of a love letter to Obi-Wan than I think anyone else. But I also wanted to highlight some of the things that Anakin did, because Order 66 is kind of turned into a meme, and so I wanted to kind of give some more personality and more emotional weight to what should be considered a really emotional scene. Obi-Wan goes through a lot of loss in this video, and I think it's because of this loss that he decides that he doesn't want to rebuild the Order. And I think that's a more fitting end for him, where he chooses a life for himself, where he gets to experience love, 
and happiness with the people that he wants to be around. And then, in my opinion, a fun way to end it was having an adventurer, someone that I don't know, that you don't know, whoever in your mind's eye is this adventurer, is the one who goes out and rebuilds the Jedi Order. So, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you. <laughs>